This is Real Women, Celebrating Women in Film. I'm your host, Brenda Daly. Um, I'm working very hard with our, our producer, uh, Action Shot Films, and we are here to talk about women in film, uh, what they do, uh, why it's important to have a uh, women's opinion in your film. And today we are talking to Jasmine Berber, and she is an actress, a producer, and a stunt woman, and she just finished a film called Party Bus. And so I wanted to say hello to you. Hey, Jasmine, how are you? Hey, Brenda. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, it's been great. So, Jasmine, I'm so super excited to talk to you because I know you've been uh, not doing films for too long, a couple of years, right? Yes. And uh, so tell uh, tell our audience uh, what your involvement in Party Bus was, like all, your, all the uh, parts that you played. So Party Bus was an endeavor between my husband, myself, and just a handful of other crew members. And so because it was such a small skeleton crew, there was a a huge opportunity for me to just jump in wherever I was needed. And so uh, initially, that was just a couple of different acting roles. I would transform myself with uh, hair, makeup, wardrobe. And so I ended up playing four different characters uh, in Party Bus, two of which you can you know, see who they are. And so we've had a couple of people actually watch the segments and say that they can't identify that I'm the same person, which is really cool for me. Um, aside from acting, I, ha- I took on smaller things such as driving talent, uh, feeding people, doing contracts. Uh, I also did fight choreography and stunt work for the film. I was just everywhere all the time. The, at one point, I jumped in and helped with special effects. It just, that's the nature with independent film. You are just there to get it done. Yeah, I think that's the whole uh, genre of independent film is you don't have just one hat. And I think that, you know, because you're you're dealing with a lower budget. And so you want to make sure you want to keep, you want to stay in budget so that you can do all of the extras that you need, like music and uh, special effects, if you need them. Um, and I think that uh, I think that's what I love about independent filmmaking is because you know I don't like to be just one thing. And it sounds like you're kind of like me, where you just like to get your hands in there, get dirty, and just get it done. Absolutely. So tell me, uh, what drew you and your husband to make this movie? So it was opportunity and divine timing, I would say. I mean, my husband has been in the game of uh, film and entertainment much longer than I have, but when I came into the picture, we had a common vision in mind to go and produce feature films and just be creatives. And thankfully enough, the opportunity came about through, you know, one of the studios here in Arizona that said, hey, you guys have the equipment, you have the talent, the crew, uh, can you make a movie for us? And so we said, sure. And they said, well, all we can give you is location. We have a bus. And can you make us a horror movie on a bus? And so we went forth and we did just absolutely everything else after that. Yeah, I think, too, uh, it's nice that they give you the opportunity to do that. And I think, too, uh, during the pandemic, everybody's budgets got even lower because, you know, they needed, you know, it's hard to get out uh, a good product. But I think if you're crafty and creative, you can always put out a good product because sometimes, you know, you don't need a lot of equipment. Oh, absolutely. I mean, when I first uh, tried dabbling in the film industry, I I had no idea what a headshot even was. I looked up examples and I thought, oh, I can do that. And I literally went into my closet and I just used enough natural lighting to get a good selfie. And I used that for my headshot for over a year. I just, I did whatever I thought worked. I wasn't really uh, too concerned about social standards. Well, I think too, uh, you have an opportunity because you do work with your husband who's been in the industry. So a lot of times, you know, this is an industry about relationships, the headshots and all of that are very, very important, but that's for people who don't know you, not for the people who know you, because you already have built that relationship. They already know who you are, what you're capable of, and maybe what you can be as opposed to what you are today. Because as you uh, work in the film industry, you're kind of evolving. Mm-hmm. You know, but when you're hiring actors, it's a different thing because as an actor, you want to put out your best self. You know what I'm saying? Well, that's what I was trying to do when I first got into the industry. Um, I didn't know my husband at the time, 
I was comp- I was pursuing film completely on my own. I wanted to be a fight choreographer and stunt person because I've done martial arts my entire life, and that's what initially drove me into film. Um, I was supposed to uh, do a fight camp. I used to fight competitively, and then uh-huh. COVID shut down all of the gyms. And I was going crazy because I was used to training for three, four hours a day, and I couldn't do it. So I thought, you know, everybody's stuck in their homes. I'm going to try something that... I would never have done otherwise, and nobody can judge me for it because they're all stuck inside anyway. And so I ended up pursuing film, and then it was just all upward from there. Yeah, and you're in Arizona, right? Correct. Yeah, yeah. So uh, can you name the studio that you work with? (laughs) Yeah, so right now we're working with Sun Studios of Arizona. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. Actually, my daughter's in a film with them. Um... They're, they're a really good studio. And I think too, they're, you know, they were subject to what everybody else was subject to. Uh, filmmaking is not an easy business. I don't know if anybody out there who has not tried to do it yet, they don't really seem to understand that, um, you know, we are all working harder and wearing many, many hats to get our films done. Right. Well, even without COVID, even without the pandemic, I would say things are much easier now than they were two years ago. But even now, I have people reaching out to me pretty frequently asking for an opportunity to come on set and to be a part of what I'm doing. And when they get that opportunity, they 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 push through on the first day, but they see that it is one of the hardest things that they have ever done. And I will easily say that it, it's one of the most difficult things I've ever done, but I love it because it is so challenging it, in creative, emotional, psychological ways. It just, it, it makes you really, really know to the core who you are and what you stand for. And that's why I love it. So what, so when it came to the script for Party Bus, because you said they had a bus. So who wrote the script? <laughs> So the brainstorming was collaborative between a few folks at the studio, myself, uh, my husband, and then our good friend, Dan. We came up with a bunch of neat ideas. We eliminated what wasn't going to work. And then my husband was the one that started the script writing process because once once my husband has a vision, he he is just absolutely incredible in what he is able to create. I love his brain so much. That was the first thing I fell in love with before I even met him in person but he started with the script writing and then when he got to a point where he thought it was good uh, he sent it out for peer review between myself and our friend Dan and so I was the one that did several revisions Um, I'm I'm nerdy I do the grammatical stuff I do the nitpicky Uh, I also ask a lot of questions Uh, I've, I've always been somebody to question whether things make sense or not. And so that's where my brain comes into play and helps revise some of the things that, you know, was some of the things that were written. Yeah. I do think that uh, every writer needs a reviser. (laughs) I know I personally, you know, I don't consider myself a writer. I put it on my thing. I do write a lot of stuff, but I always lean on those people that I trust because I want them to tell me what they really think. Cause I think, you know, you have to have people that you, you trust and you got to kind of put your ego to the side. So it sounds like you guys have a really good collaborative effort going on. Like there's a lot of trust and, you know, belief in one another. And I think that's 85% of making a movie. (laughs) That, and we have no problem uh, challenging each other. In fact, we enjoy it and appreciate it. And we do not take offense to anything people say, even if it's, you know, why would you do that? That doesn't make sense. Other people may get offended and a bit defensive, whereas we we begin the debate saying, trying to explain why it makes sense. And that's how we fill in the holes. But you have to have that, I, I believe, in filmmaking. Otherwise, I'm not sure what you're doing in the industry. But you have to have the voice of reason. You yeah, know, And you have to be able to take criticism. I mean, you are going to receive criticism at every level. And the higher you get, the more criticism you receive. And you have to be able to s- distinguish between the helpful and the non-helpful and be able to just take it and run with it. Oh, absolutely. So I went, I thought it was really interesting because you and I had a pre-talk and you had talked about uh, the industry you were in before you became a filmmaker. And I wanted to talk to you about that and what made you decide to switch. Sure. Uh, So I've only been in filmmaking for about two and a half years. It's been short ferocious, uh, burning, you know, at both ends, but I wouldn't have it any other way. 
prior to coming into filmmaking, I was a career engineer. Uh, I went to school for eight years to get my master's in mechanical engineering, and I worked with Boeing on the Apache program for six years. I did areas in um, systems engineering, uh, thermal analysis, blade design, all of that fun stuff. And I absolutely love it. It it aligns with the way my brain works, but it was lacking in the level of creativity that I also live in. Um, for a while, engineering was absolutely perfect for me. I could be creative to some extent, but not to the extent of, you know, my brain kind of lives in a, a fantasy. And so that's where film came in. I could bring my engineering problem solving brain into the world, but also a heightened sense of creativity. Yeah, I feel like uh, being an engineer is a very brainy job. And I do, I kind of see because you do, you're always kind of uh, putting out fires to make sure that everything mechanically is working correctly. You know, and it, everything's always about trial and error. So I think filmmaking really does match your. I'm I'm so glad you know that. And and in our talk, you mentioned that it was because your father worked for Boeing, and so I'm sure you heard all about the 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 stuff that he had to deal with, both good, bad, and ugly. And well, a lot he couldn't what you... talk about. <laughs> Just so you know, like he was he was literally not uh, able to bring that home. But I do understand that you know. It's critical thinking. That's what it is. Yeah. And like you said, you are constantly putting out fires. And especially when the pandemic hit and we were still open, I my job went from design engineering to, uh, you know, a fireman. That's what it felt like. And so that was OK. It still required problem solving. But coming into the film industry, it's absolutely no different at all. It's just a different animal. And once I understood how the machine worked, it was just it works. Yeah, I have been finding that a lot of women that I talk to who have not been doing filmmaking for a long, for very long, um, they're high end business women. They're women that have uh, been doing um, CEOs of big corporations. Like for you know, for some reason, I think they just never realized, or maybe there wasn't somebody in their family that touched in on this. Bless you. Excuse me. But hasn't touched in on you know on this industry. But like you said, now, because the equipment's not as expensive, um, you know, you can learn if you do enough studying how to use the equipment properly. And then, you know, and then you have that creative brain where, you know, you just have to really storytell. Uh, my father was an actor. And so, and he, my dad could literally, he could play an instrument if he wanted to, maybe not very well, but he would always try to tackle things that would solve problems. And I think that uh, that's why ever, that's why we're also drawn to film, you know? I think so too. I, my brain has just always worked in a very peculiar way that made me feel different from others when I was younger. And then I realized that my brain was more aligned with the engineering community. Uh, it's just, it's a very systematic way of thinking. I need to understand the problem thoroughly and ask questions enough to understand before I can even implement a solution. And that's where I shine in filmmaking. But because I also have the creative element, I can come up with the creative ways to solve a problem. And as an engineer, there's no such thing as we can't find a solution. It's there is a solution. And that's something that a lot of people struggle with in film is that they think, oh, I just don't have the time, the money, the knowledge, resources to find a solution, but there is always a solution. And that's where my husband and I really connect when we're working together because we're both on the same path that there is always a solution, even when everybody around us, and we've had this happen before where everyone around us is saying, just move on, get it another day, end it early, just cut it short, just cut corners. And we say, no, absolutely not. No, I think too, uh, as a filmmaker, that's your baby. I mean, you know, and like you had said, everybody's judging you. So you live and die by it. Um, I've got, so I wanted to know, is your film in distribution right now? Is it, what, what's the status of it? So what I was told, uh, and this is the plan thus far, at least that's been, you know, uh, relayed to me is that come December 3rd, the film will be released, but I don't know what streaming platforms it will be released to. Right. They so probably that is the plan. All of them. They're probably accumulating them for a distribution company. Yeah. Usually they're accumulating their platforms and then they want to release them all at once so that when you guys have your heavy launch, 
they launch them all at once. Um, I was just, I'm recently in a film uh, called Night of the Tommy Knockers and they, they literally oh. had a big poster. Yeah. So they have a big poster and it has all of their streaming platforms and there's a ton of them. So, you know, but, you know, as a filmmaker or, and a distribution company, they want to collect all, as many as they can. So the filmmaker knows that they're, you know, they're doing their job and they're getting it out there, you know. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So I want to go back to your stunt work. I know you've been doing martial arts. Have you done martial arts your whole life? Yeah, effectively. I mean, since I was 14 years old, I started in high school and I I was kind of, I was a really weird kid. Uh, I, I got to go back just a little bit. I was a really weird kid in high school because I was homeschooled and then my parents split up. And so then they ended up putting me into this public private school and I just lived life according to how I thought it worked, which was I had zero understanding of social standards uh, and I didn't care. And so when I got to school, I, you know, I, I found a few people that were nice to me, but otherwise I spent a lot of time alone and that was OK. When I got to martial arts, it didn't matter who you were. You got punched in the face regardless. <laughs> if, you, if, you couldn't, if you couldn't if you couldn't keep your hands up it doesn't matter if you're the weird kid or the popular kid you got punched and it made me feel like I have friends <laughs> and so it's actually very funny though but I feel like everybody I mean I'm you know I did, I went to public school but I always felt like um and I was always the, the weird theater kid but I always felt like um I think if you know who you are then you're really not the weird kid it's the what it's the weird ones that are always following along with what everybody else is doing because and because they don't have any identity. It felt I feel like you you've kind of you kind of you know if you think you're the weird kid, you're probably the one who knows who you who you are more than the rest. I think so, and I didn't realize that's what it was at the time. I just knew what I liked, what I didn't like, who I wanted to associate with, but I didn't realize that was part of identity. I just knew that. I didn't want to do what those other kids were doing, but, so um, you, but with, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I, I was, was going to say with the, um, with the martial arts, I, I really found a love for it just because of how, because of my analytical brain, I took that to the, I took my martial arts to the next level and understanding the human body when it comes to martial arts, understanding the physics of it. And so I carried that throughout my entire college career after college. And uh, once I got into, you know, my mid twenties, I decided that I wanted to fight competitively. And so I took my training to the next level in the sense of doing fight camps and incorporating the diet and uh, cardio regimen and just being so analytical of everything I did with my training. So just I, I think martial arts at this point, it, it's part of my identity, whether I like it or not. <laughs> I do believe my kids did a karate when they were young. I'm not much of an athlete, but uh, most of my kids did. And they, they got black belts, I think, when they were 11 years old in Taekwondo. But they even carried it. They, di they didn't continue on, but they did carry it into other sports because they were extremely coordinated. I think, you know, any kind of karate or martial arts is just great for mind, body, and soul because they always... If you're into martial arts, they always uh, stress on, you know, you have to be a good person. It's really not, it is about defending yourself, but it's really about, you know, being good to one another and support. Because when you're breaking boards, you better have those people supporting you to make you believe in yourself to do that. Agreed. However, me personally, I've, I'm a very docile person by nature. I'm, I'm very nurturing and motherly and that is... That innate that allowed me to enable people to walk all over me throughout my life, unfortunately. And martial arts helped me steer away from that. But it wasn't until I got into uh, competitive fighting where it was, I have to choose to enter this ring with the intention to hurt the other person. I wanted to know that I was capable of that. Because we can be nice. We can help each other outside of the ring. We can be nice afterwards. But in this moment this is my moment and you are not going to take it for me. And I really well, struggled with that mentality my entire life. Yeah. But I, I think what, what I was saying was more like, it's like acting or even making a film is it's, you can't get to the point where you're in the, in the ring 
to be that killer fighter until you have, you know that there's people waiting for you that have had your back, that have given you the strength and the backup to let you understand that you are capable of it and they're supporting you because you're part of that group. And usually, you know, in classes you take, you know, group classes. And so you have people cheering you on in class and it's like practice. It's like acting. You practice, practice, practice so that, and you practice in front of the cast and the crew and the director so that when you're in that moment, there's so much trust on set that as an actor, you just go, you go there and it, and it, and it feels right. And you don't even notice that they're there because you trust them so much. Yeah, that is a wonderful feeling to have. And then it's also a give and take because when you're in that moment, you are, it is up to you. You have the people behind you that support you and want to see you succeed, but that doesn't stop you from messing it up if you don't do your part. And so in that moment, you are kind of alone because you have well, you, to, you you have to have do it. You should have to lean on. I mean, if you're not doing what, if he doesn't see it in that, in the monitor, if he doesn't see what he's looking for, maybe he's not even looking at the monitor. Maybe he's just looking at you. If he doesn't see what he wants, he should have you do it again and, and, and then go back to that, that safe space. And sometimes the take that you don't like is sometimes the take you use because when you see it on that big screen, it's like, oh no, they got that right and I didn't. So it has to be trust that you have, because once you're the actor and you've done that moment, it's the director's responsibility to find the best one of those moments so that the film will be more and more successful. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. I just, I, I've put a lot of responsibility on myself to do things correctly, even as an actor. Um, Cause there are some, I mean, it is your job as an actor to come on set and act. A director can give you direction, but once you're there, your job is to just excel in whatever the role is. And so that's something that I've found success in as an actress is I do a lot of character study. I, I have to know my character as if they are real and so I bring a perspective on who the character is. And so there have been times where I'm on set and I ask, why would the character do this? Because in the, the scenes prior to, this happened. So it doesn't make sense for her character arc to go this way. And it's resulted in, you know, changes happening. But I just, I take that much love and care in what I do as an actress. And so I just, I've always felt that it's my responsibility to bring that level of not necessarily perfectionism, but just that le well, that level of understanding. It's that level of understanding of who the character is. I just, I have to know. I can't not. Well, I think it's a level of professionalism. And the thing is, is that, I mean, for those actors out there is your job is to break down the scene. Your job is to break down the character. Your job is to do all the analytical stuff before you get on set. But once you're on set and you've done your job because your job is to know your lines and break it down and, you know, see where it fits, where you fit in that character to make it believable. But once you are literally when it's you're at, at action and red light, you should be will, you should be able to just let all of that go because your subconscious has all of that and you should be able to just release it and be it, you, you know, acting is being, so yes, you have to analyze like if you were building a part to a plane, but you have to be in that moment. You can no longer be analyzing why you should already have known why two weeks before you're filming. You should know all those answers before not in that moment, because it'll make for a much more realistic performance. You know what I'm saying? And then it's the director's so responsibility to make you feel safe. And make you understand that, yes, you've done all the work, but I just want to adjust it a little bit this way. And then you should be able to just adjust and go. Never worry about why. You know what I mean? And so as my uh, my character that I play in Party Bus Angel, I completely embodied who she was. Uh, she, because I was able to be a part of the screenwriting process, I was able to give her more of an identity. And I pulled from friends, family members, things I understood about, um, you know, my mother's from New Zealand. And so I know that culture quite well. I know the accent very well. And so I was able to help write the character as if she was real, but she kind of is because she's based on real people. Well, she was real to you. And that's, and that's what makes a good performance. 
I mean, as long as they're real to you, you know, and I think being part of the screenwriting process really does help, you know, because, you know, they always say there's three ways when you do a film, it's three ways telling the story. The writer tells the story, then the director tells the story, and then the editor tells the final story. So it's actually a storytelling three times and the editor always gets final say. Now, if the director and the writer are the editor, then life is good. <laughs> but then the actor also brings their own personal perspective onto the role because no actor is going to be the exact embodiment of what the writer is going to write, even if you're part of that, because everything's always changing and evolving. So since you were there from the beginning to the end, you got the opportunity to change and evolve as the film changed and evolved, which I think is the best way to be, <laughs> in my opinion. Right. I wish it could always be like that, but no, just roll with it. It was a very special opportunity. In fact, uh, it was the the final straw into me leaving my job with Boeing. Um, I had been working with Boeing full time while pursuing film full time, and I made it happen. But congratulations! You know, I got to <laughs> thank you. I got to a point where I had grown tremendously in the film industry, and I was still going to make the two worlds work together. But it just it didn't, it was not working. And I could feel that I was needed heavily for this film because it was such a small crew. And so I ended up leaving Boeing and becoming a full-time filmmaker. And that was uh, April of last year. I, no, I, it would have been December of last year. Yeah. I think what I love about that is that uh, my husband has no desire to do film. Like he's great at helping me you know, build a story like that part. But as far as being on set, you know, he didn't want anything to do with it. So I love the fact that you and your husband kind of have come together because I think it, it gives you twice the power. It gives you twice the power to do the next project and twice, you know, you, you're always, and, and if, you know, I know it's not always cohesive, but for the most part, the, the end result is always a mutual prospect. So I think that that, and you guys, you know, you guys do have different ideas and opinions. So when the end result comes, it, it comes from more perspective than a single filmmaker because a single filmmaker usually has their eyes set in one direction and they don't, even though they're creative, they don't, it, it's hard for them to open up creativity, creativity, I can't even say it. creativity, open the creativity up. And I think that you guys have that back and forth, which is fantastic. I think so too. And also, I mean, my husband is far more the creative one than I am. He, like I said, I just, I absolutely fell in love with his brain before I even met him. And one thing that I bring is my analytical skills because I'm also finite, like very business savvy. And so he and I, we challenge each other constantly, but it's in very fun and playful ways because we both like being right. We both like doing <laughs> enough research to be able to defend our case and we have so many playful debates about why something makes sense. And then we end up coming out of the conversation with more understanding and knowledge than we did prior to. And that's just what keeps us so, so happy together because we, we challenge each other more. Like people would think that uh, it would cause a lot of fights, but it's just, he's my best friend and I can absolutely challenge him on anything. And, and I love it. Yeah. And he, and he trusts your opinion, which is amazing. Uh, so what I want you to give me or take a, put a shout out for your husband because it's very important to have uh, people that you care about's names out there when you're on a podcast. Absolutely. So to my husband, Carlos Berber, I love you so much. And then I also want to give a huge shout out to our friend Dan Miller because Dan has been there through a lot of. Am I allowed to curse on this show? Go ahead. I don't. Care. I don't <laughs> he's been through a lot of shit with us I'll say and he has been doing it with a smile on his face and uh, you know are are the only other two people in our lives that have helped to make this happen is Ignacio Fimbres and Angel Salazar they've been there they've had our backs this entire time and Party Fest wouldn't have been possible without uh, Ignacio because he was the other part of the skeleton crew uh-huh that's super exciting so I wanted to ask you so if you were to talk to yourself before you met your husband about being a filmmaker, what would you give yourself advice about? Uh, trust yourself because 
being an engineer for so long, I I was highly knowledgeable and functional in that particular environment. But once I came into filmmaking, uh, I convinced myself that because I knew nothing, I was not capable of achieving much. And so that's where the pursuit of knowledge came in, which was great. You know, it was a great motivating factor. But I had so many in I had so many moments of intuition that I pushed away because I just wasn't sure. And I wish if I could tell myself to just listen to my intuition, I I think it would have relieved a lot of anxiety and self-doubt. So tell me what the plot line is for party, party bus that you can tell me, because I know, you know, depending on so that the viewers will know what the movie is kind of about and why they should go watch it. So party bus is essentially about two brothers coming together after over 16 years of separation. The older brother ended up going to prison and the younger brother was left to grow up on his own. And so the younger brother is quite is quite a spineless character. And so we meet, we end up coming into the story and meeting the younger brother and his friends. And I play the best friend in the film. Uh-huh. Um, in order to celebrate the younger brother's, uh, you know, holy matrimony that's taking place the next day, I order a party bus for us. And so we're off to go celebrate. And then uh, that is where I reveal to the younger brother that I have found his older brother and they are reunited. In that moment, the older brother reveals that he has actually been keeping an eye on his younger brother and he sees that his friends are actually pieces of crap. And (laughs) if anybody, all the people on the bus had earned their seats and they're going to have a moment of truth with the younger brother. And so the older brother effectively essentially tells, you know, the party, uh, you are going to tell the truth or I will burn you with it. Oh, that's kind of cool. So let, so tell them, I I just want you to tell them something. So what's the log line of this movie? Do you know? Uh, I'm not sure. We've had a couple of different variations, but I'm not sure what's out there officially right now. Uh Uh-huh. And do you guys have a trailer that we can put in at the end of this podcast? Absolutely. Yeah, I can send you a link to that. Okay, so basically what uh, we do, as our audience already knows, is I usually put the trailer at the end of the in this podcast, so you should be able to find uh, Jasmine, and then, of course, I will put your IMDb link, and then a short biography of it, about Jasmine. I feel like you guys are... Do you have any projects coming up? So we have... Let me see. We have one that was also that's also going to be released through Sun Studios, but that the release date is TBD. It could be several months uh, Uh because it's still in post-production. And then we have another feature film that we actually just wrapped on post-production. So nothing that's going to be uh, relatively soon. So that uh, people can follow you. Names of the Uh, project. Any project names that you can give out or you don't know yet? Uh, no major names. Uh, it's all independent. Another reason why I love our projects. Uh, we will get uh, some names like uh, for House That Eats Flesh, we acquired Lisa Wilcox. She was in Nightmare on Elm Street. Uh, no, I meant, the name. I meant the name of the movies. <laughs> oh, every time we say names, it's like relating to actors. I'm so sorry. I know. No, I know. I switch around a lot. It's not you. It's me. Go ahead. Um. I would say the the best way to follow what's going on is just our social medias. And then I can include, you know, names of upcoming projects. Okay. So for your audience that's watching this, uh, Jasmine is going to give me those socials and then I will put them in the link below. Um, Is there anything that you want your audience to know before we sign off? So to any of the men, women, young, old, you know, just just filmmakers that are just now treading the waters in the industry. Don't be afraid to ask all of the questions, find the information and put yourself out there. So many people are just scared to make a move, but just it is always better to do something than nothing. So put yourself out there. Yeah, I think that is the genre for uh, real women is that everybody, you know, if you're going to do it, just do it. You're going to have your naysayers. 
I feel like uh, Jasmine and her husband are the gladiators for independent filmmaking, and I'm super excited <laughs> for them. Um, I am close by. Uh, if you guys ever need anything, if, even if you need crew or something, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm in Las Vegas. Where Vegas. are you? I'm in Las oh, Vegas. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so if you guys ever need anything or, or just people, you know, I do have access to that. And I just wanted to say that you guys are definitely the kind of spirit that this show was made for, was because I feel like, you know, I don't think any big filmmaker should make a movie until they've done an independent film, a very low budget <laughs> independent film, because I think that is the biggest training ground for all of us. And I really it's so want to true. Yeah. And then also it's saying, what can you do with absolutely zero budget and just the will to get it done? Absolutely. That's, and that's what, <laughs> and that's what this show is about to empower people that have, if, even if you just make one film, you need to do it. Uh, feature films are a lot harder than short films. Short films are great, but I, I don't think you don't really get in that big training ground until you do a full feature film. And I love the yep. fact that you and your husband are working together. And it's been so wonderful talking to you, Jasmine. And I would love to talk to you in the feature, uh, opening of your other features. And uh, I just wanted to tell everybody, thank you for tuning in. This is Brenda Daly with Jasmine Berber and her movie coming out very soon, uh, Party Bus. Can't wait to see it. And this is Real Women Celebrating Women in Film. Thank you, Jasmine. Thank you, Brenda. Yeah, it was really fun. Thanks a lot. Now look, Austin, I'm sorry I did this on such an important night. But I made you a mob promise. As for the rest of you, each and every one of you earned your seat on this bus. Now the rules are simple. You either speak the truth Or, I burn you with it.